All right, so this is the beginning of section three, Burning Bright, but self-titled this section of the reading, To Be or Not To Be. Lights flicked on and house doors opened all down the street to watch the carnival set up. Montag and Betty stared, one with dry satisfaction, the other with disbelief, at the house before them, this main ring in which torches would be juggled and fire eaten. Well, <coughs> said Betty, now you did it. Old Montag wanted to fly near the sun, and now that he's burnt his damn wings, he wonders why. Didn't I hint enough when I sent the hound around your place? Montag's face was entirely numb and featureless. He felt his head turn like a stone carving to the dark place next door, set in its bright border of flowers. Beatty snorted. Oh no, you weren't fooled by that little idiot's routine now, were you? Flowers, butterflies, leaves, sunsets, oh hell, it's all in her fire. I'll be damned, I've hit the bullseye. Look at that sick look on your face. A few grass blades and the quarters of the moon. What trash. What good does she ever do with all that? Montag sat on the cold fender of the dragon, moving his head half an inch to the left, half an inch to the right. Left, right, left, right, left. She saw everything. She didn't do anything to anyone. She just let them alone. Alone, hell, she chewed around you, didn't she? One of those damn do-gooders with their shocked holier-than-thou silences, their one talent making others feel guilty. They rise like the midnight sun to sweat you in your bed. The front door opened. Mildred came down the steps, running, one suitcase held with a dreamlike clenching rigidity in her fist as a beetle taxi hissed to the curb. Mildred! She ran past with her body stiff, her face flowered with powder, her mouth gone without lipstick. Mildred, you didn't put in the alarm. She shoved the valise in the waiting beetle, climbed in and sat mumbling. Poor family, poor family. Oh, everything gone, everything, everything gone now. Baby grabbed Montag's shoulder as the beetle blasted away and hit 70 miles an hour far down the street, gone. There was a crash like the falling parts of a dream fashioned out of warped glass mirrors and crystal prisms. Montag drifted about as if still another incompre incomprehensible storm had turned him. To see stonemen in black wielding axes, shattering window panes to provide cross ventilation. The brush of a death's head moth against a cold black screen. Montag, this is favor. Do you hear me? What's happening? This is happening to me, said Montag. What a dreadful surprise, said Beatty. For everyone nowadays knows, absolutely is certain, that nothing will ever happen to me. Others die, I go on. There are no consequences and no responsibilities, except that there are. But let's not talk about them, eh? By the time the consequences catch up with you, it's too late, isn't it, Montag? Montag, can you get away? Run? asked Faber. Montag walked but did not feel his feet touch the cement. And then the night grasses. Beatty flicked his igniter nearby and the small orange flame drew his fascinated gaze. What is there about fire that's so lovely? No matter what age we are, what draws us to it? Beatty blew out the flame and lit it again. It's perpetual motion. The thing man wanted to invent but never did or almost perpetual motion. If you let it go on, it'd burn our lifetimes out. What is fire? It's a mystery. Scientists give us a gobbledygook about friction and molecules, but they don't really know. Its real beauty is that it destroys responsibility and consequences. A problem gets too burdensome, then into the furnace with it. Now, Montag, you're a burden and fire will lift you off my shoulders. Clean, quick, sure. Nothing to rot later. Antibiotic, aesthetic, practical. Montag stood looking in now at this queer house, made strange by the hour of the night, by murmuring <coughs> neighbor voices, by littered glass, and there on the floor their covers torn off and spilled out like swan feathers. The incredible books that looked so silly and really not worth bothering with, for these were nothing but black type and yellowed paper and raveled binding. 
Mildred, of course. She must have watched him hide the books in the garden and brought them back in. Mildred. Mildred. I wanted you to do this job all by your lonesome, Montag. Not with kerosene and a match, but piecework with a flamethrower. Your house, your cleanup. Montag, can't you run? Get away? No, cried Montag helplessly. The hound, because of the hound. Faber heard and Beatty, thinking it was meant for him, heard. Yes, the hound somewhere about the neighborhood, so don't try anything. Ready? Ready. Montag snapped the safety catch on the flamethrower. Fire! A great nuzzling gout of fire leapt out to lap at the books and knock them against the wall. He stepped into the bedroom and fired twice, and then the twin beds went up in a great simmering whisper, with more heat and passion and light than he would have supposed them to contain. He burnt the bedroom walls and the cosmetics chest because he wanted to change everything, the chairs, the tables, and in the dining room, the silverware and plastic dishes, everything that showed that he had lived here in this empty house with a strange woman who would forget him tomorrow, who had gone and quite forgotten him already, listening to her seashell radio pour in on her and in on her as she rode across town, alone. And as before, it was good to burn. He felt himself gush out in the fire, snatch, rend, rip in half with flame, and put away the senseless problem. If there was no solution, well then now there was no problem either. Father, fire was best for everything. The books, Montag. The books leapt and danced like roasted birds, their wings ablaze with red and yellow feathers. And then he came to the parlor where the great idiot monsters lay asleep with their white thoughts and their snowy dreams. And he shot a bolt at each of the three blank walls and the vacuum hissed out at him. The emptiness made an even emptier whistle, a senseless scream. He tried to think about the vacuum upon which the nothingness had performed, but he could not. He held his breath so the vacuum could not get into his lungs. He cut off its terrible emptiness drew back and gave the entire room a gift of one huge bright yellow flower of burning. The fireproof plastic sheath on everything was cut wide, and the house began to shudder with flame. When you're quite finished, said Beatty behind him, you're under arrest. The house fell in red coals and black ash. It bedded itself down in sleepy pink-gray cinders and a smoke plume blew over it, rising and waving slowly back and forth in the sky. It was 3.30 in the morning. The crowd drew back into the houses. The great tents of the circus had slumped into charcoal and rubble and the show was well over. Montag stood with the flamethrower in his limp hands. Great islands of perspiration drenching his armpits. His face smeared with soot. The other firemen waited behind him in the darkness, their faces illumined faintly by the smoldering foundation. Montag started to speak twice and then finally managed to put his thought together. Was it my wife turned in the alarm? Beatty nodded. But her friends turned in an alarm earlier that I let ride. One way or the other you'd have got it. It was pretty silly quoting poetry around free and easy like that. It was the act of a silly damn snob. Give a man a few lines of verse and he thinks he's the lord of all creation. Think you can walk on water with your books? Well, the world can get by just fine without them. Look where they got you and slime up to your lip. If I stir the slime with my little finger, you'll drown. Montag could not move. A great earthquake had come with fire and leveled the house and Mildred was under there somewhere and his entire life under there and he could not move. The earthquake was still shaking and falling and shivering inside him, and he stood there, his knees half bent under the great load of tiredness and bewilderment and outrage, letting Beatty hit him without raising a hand. Montag, you idiot. Montag, you damn fool. Why did you really do it? Montag did not hear. He was far away. He was running with his mind. He was gone, leaving this dead, soot-covered body to sway in front of another raving fool. Montag, get out of there, said Faber. Montag listened. Beatty struck him a blow on the head that sent him reeling back. The green bullet in which Faber's voice whispered and cried fell to the sidewalk. Beatty snatched it up, grinning. He held it half in, half out of his ear. Montag heard the distant voice calling. Montag, you're all right? 
Beatty switched the green bullet off and thrust it in his pocket. Well, so there's more here than I thought. I saw you tilt your head listening. First I thought you had a seashell. But when you turned clever later, I wondered. We'll trace this and drop in on your friend. No, said Montag. He twitched the safety catch on the flamethrower. Beatty glanced instantly at Montag's fingers and his eyes widened the faintest bit. Montag saw the surprise there and himself glanced to his hands to see what new thing they had done. Thinking back later, he could never decide whether the hands or Beatty's reaction to the hands gave him the final push toward murder. The last rolling thunder of the avalanche stoned down about his ears, not touching him. Beatty grinned his most charming grin. Well, that's one way to get an audience. Hold a gun on a man and force him to listen to your speech. Speech away. What will it be this time? Why don't you belt Shakespeare at me, you fumbling snob? There is no terror, Cassius, in your threats, for I am armed so strong in honesty that they pass by me as an idle wind which I respect not. How's that? Go ahead now, you second-hand literature. Pull the trigger. He took one step toward Montag. Montag only said, We never burned right. Hand it over, guy, said Beatty with a fixed smile. And then he was a shrieking blaze, a jumping, sprawling, gibbering mannequin. No longer human or known, all writhing flame on the lawn as Montag shot one continuous pulse of liquid fire on him. There was a hiss like a great mouthful of spittle banging a red-hot stove, a bubbling and a frothing as if salt had been poured over a monstrous black snail to cause a terrible liquefaction, a boiling over of yellow foam. <clears throat> Montag shut his eyes, shouted, shouted, and fought to get his hands at his ears to clamp and to cut away the sound. Beatty flopped over and over and over and at last twitched in on himself like a charred wax doll and lay silent. The other two firemen did not move. Montag kept his sickness down long enough to aim the flamethrower. Turn around! They turned their faces like blanched meat, streaming sweat. He beat their heads, knocking off their helmets and bringing them down on themselves. They fell and lay without moving. 